In today's episode, yeah. think of what that word is. Okay. And imagine that you take it and you spell it in all capital letters. So if I were spelling your name, B I L A L, but capital. So they're all the same size and mix them up a little and just stop. And now grab one of those letters out as if you're just holding it in your hand. Grab one of the letters right now out of that word. Do you have one? Yeah. Look at me. Think of that letter. I can tell you what you wouldn't have done. You didn't pick a vowel, did you? No. You know why? Because mm. everyone knows there's vowels in words. A, E, I, O, U. It's too limiting. You know there's only five of them. Nobody picks the vowel at that moment, even though you could have because you thought it was too obvious. And mm. you looked and you debated. You didn't do the first letter because you're like, ah, it's too. You did something in the middle and you kind of looked and you're about to grab one next to the other. Yeah. Are you thinking of the letter C? Oh, my God. Am I right? <laughs> and this is not set up. You have to tell them. No, this, no, is this is not is nothing. Nothing. This is a thought in your mind. Oh and my notice God. how my hand gesture. I want in the camera, you're going to see this. I literally made this oh C. And then I <laughs> okay. don't want you to see. I'm going to write this down, but oh. you could have thought of anything. And Can can people see what you're writing? There, yes, but if okay. you could close your eyes for a moment. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not doing That's mad, man. Tell us, okay. what were you thinking about? What was the first thing that popped in your mind when I said anything you could think of a subject? And you go, no, no, too easy, I'm yeah, changed. Yeah. What did you think of? Podcasting. Podcasts. Oh, my God, okay. Which yeah. I know everyone now is going to say, like, that's so obvious, obvious we're on yeah. a podcast. But yeah, I assure you, <laughs> there's a million other things you could have picked. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Well, thanks for having I'm me. I'm going to shake your hand again. Let's do it. I, yeah, I we, had a, we had a misfire a, first handshake. I gave you a weak handshake. We missed. It just was we didn't connect properly. It's funny. Like today, we're going to be talking about nonverbal communication and all these sorts of fun things. And when I was like 12 years old, I probably read in a book somewhere that you're supposed to give a strong handshake. And I've read that. But for some reason, like I, I don't always I'm naturally just like, oh, I'm such a like relaxed guy. But like I need to work on that. It's uh, something, what, what do you think, as an expert, is that something that really does communicate value and all those things that people say it does? I think so. I think the handshake with the eye contact is, is just a, is a differentiator, right, between certain people. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a firm believer, pun intended, yeah. in, in like a solid <laughs> shake. And if I miss the shake, I don't feel right. I'm like, let's go back in. Let's go back in for the real deal. Go, for like, hug. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm a hugger too. Yeah, me too. Uh, we'll do that after. All right. <laughs> well, listen, man, we, we met a few years ago by this point. We yeah. actually met at a corporate gig that you were doing in the holiday season. And you kind of just wowed the crowd. You were just roaming around doing your thing. And I've seen a bunch of people do magic. Right. But this was just like another level. And then when I looked you up after, I was like, oh, wow, you're actually one of the top mentalists around. Well, thank right? you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, you were on uh, America's Got Talent. Yep. Right. You were a finalist. You were runner up. Yep. I don't know how you didn't win that. I watched it again last night. But anyway, <laughs> you were just to get to that level is already insane. Uh, you are wowing the crowd every every week. Um, and you've done so many things. So we're going to go into your background in a bit. But just from your side, like, how would you normally describe yourself if you met someone at a, a dinner party or something like that? Oh, so this is a slippery slope because when you describe yourself as a mentalist, you open yourself up to a podcast of interviews like this. Yeah. It's like, what? What does that mean? What do you do? Read my mind right now, buddy. And so you get all these questions. Um, I'm one who always kind of flips the script and I do the opposite of this situation. I ask a lot of questions about the other person. I try to do more listening than telling in my day to day. But if I were to describe myself a quick elevator pitch, it's that. It's a mentalist. Uh, I have a show that it, it seemingly shows me reading people's minds. It's an interactive presentation that's unlike anything most people have ever seen. It truly doesn't fit in any of the boxes. Like when you think of a magic show, you think of sleight of hand, you think of card tricks, birds, boxes. I don't have anything. Cutting people in Yeah, half. I show up with a little briefcase. Sometimes I show up with nothing, kind of like a speaker or stand-up comedian and perform for... 20 people or, you know, close to 20,000. I've done arenas. Yeah. What arena? What was the biggest I've one? I've done T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. I think that capacity was 15,000 plus. Verizon Center um, in Washington, D.C. Places where, you know, huge bands and professional sports teams play. And those were under the guise of corporate events or uh, major national um, organizations. Cool. And y your show, that was on, it was on... 
NBC was I it? had a, sh- a TV show last year and yeah. that was an Emmy award winning show yeah I what does that actually because I always know Emmy is a is a big deal but what does that actually mean like what? I don't know what it means <laughs> <laughs> I mean I've got this big trophy at that's home amazing. it's gold that's hilarious I guess I can write Emmy award winner for, for the rest of my life yeah, that's, but it's like New York Times bestseller or like I guess oh, I mean, so. well it's probably harder to get but, no I'm uh, sh- I would rather have the New York Times bestseller well, maybe you do hopefully both, one yeah. works into the next who knows I haven't written a book yet cool man well so listen normally I, I jump into the story and I like to hear all about your background which we're definitely going to do and then we're going to talk about um, non-verbal communication how that can be applied in you know the working business world because this is a business podcast but also this podcast is really just about growth it's about personal growth whether that's in your personal or professional life and I think someone like you not to get too uh, into the weeds yet but you've had such an interesting story and the way you've evolved and you've turned your hobby or your passion as a kid into a full-time career and business and you know you've been very smart about the way you position yourself the way you brand yourself even today looking super sharp thank right? you like hey. you know what you're doing right and um so we'll go into all of that again but lesson you know, number one flattery will get you <laughs> everywhere <laughs> yeah we'll get you in the room at least but yeah so um why don't we just kick things off? Like, let's show people we're, we're on youtube.com forward slash creator lab FM. And I should also mention we're here in New York. Right. Uh, and I want to thank Canal Street Market and uh, Listening Party for hosting us. Uh, yes. Great, great little venue yeah, here. It's really cool, you. right? And if, if you're ever in New York, you should come and check out the space. They've got amazing food and yeah, vendors and stuff like that. So yeah, much stuff really around cool. here. But yeah, so uh, yeah, I guess, you know, there's no better way for us to start than just to demonstrate. It's hard to explain what you do. Right. Let's just show people. So if, if you're listening to this on the podcast, you know, I'd advise you to try and maybe check it out on youtube.com forward slash creator lab FM. If you're watching on video on Instagram or something, you'll see this. Uh, but hopefully, even if you're listening, you'll be able to follow along. Um, but yeah, man, like, l- well, let, let me, me ask you, yeah, let's what do I do? Right. So when you think of a magician, you think of somebody spreads a deck of cards and you pick a card. There's something physical there, right? But a thought is fleeting, can happen in the blink of an eye. You could think of one thing, and then a second later you think of something else. A hundred times a second. So when you walked in here, I wanted to get your brain moving, thinking. And I said, think of a subject that, that you don't even know anything about. Did, did you do that? Did you think of something that you don't even know anything about? Yeah, I don't know much about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But where would your brain have gone first? So the first thing, you thought of something else. And I could see it fleetingly in your eyes. You go, I thought of something but then you switch because you said this thing I know a little bit about, but this one I don't. Am I right? That's the way the brain yeah. works. Yeah. You don't want to think of, for example, your best friend's name because a moment later you'll go, he must have looked at my Facebook. He must know that that. Yeah. So I want you to go back to what I would describe as the impossible moment. Before you made a choice, wh- what you were thinking about before that moment. Can you think about that right now? Don't tell me. Just well, think about it. Well, I was thinking before. Well, I don't know. Happened. Whatever popped in your head first, okay. and then for some reason it wasn't good enough, you changed your mind. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. How many words form that thought? Don't tell me the word or words, but tell me how many words are in it. The original word. Yeah. Um, it's just one. Okay, don't say. Think okay. of it. Oh, okay. That's Sorry. it. Think Sorry. of it. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Think of what that word is. Okay. And imagine that you take it and you spell it in all capital letters. So if I were spelling your name, B-I-L-A-L, but capital. So they're all the same size and mix them up a little and just stop. And now grab one of those letters out as if you're just holding it in your hand. Grab one of the letters right now out of that word. Do you have one? Yeah. Look at me. Think of that letter. I can tell you what you wouldn't have done. You didn't pick a vowel, did you? No. You know why? Mm. Because everyone knows there's vowels in words. A, E, I, O, U. It's too limiting. You know there's only five of them. Nobody picks the vowel at that moment, even though you could have because you thought it was too obvious. And Mm. you looked... And you debated. You didn't do the first letter because you're like, ah, it's too. You did something in the middle, and you kind of looked, and you're about to grab one next to the other. Yeah. Are you thinking of the letter C? Oh my God. Am I right? Dude, shut up. And this is not set up. You have to tell them no, this, no, is this is not is nothing. Nothing. This is a thought in your mind. Oh and my notice God. how my hand gestured. I want in the camera. You're gonna see this. I literally made this oh C, my God. and then I <laughs> okay. don't want you to see. I'm gonna write this down, but oh. you could have thought of anything. And can can people see what you're writing? Yes, but if okay. you could close your eyes for a moment. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll look down. That's mad, man. Tell us, okay. what were you thinking about? What was the first thing that popped in your mind when I said anything you could think of a subject? And you go, no, no, it's too easy. I'm yeah, changed. Yeah. What did you think of? Podcasting. Podcasts. Oh, my God. Okay. Which yeah. I know everyone now is going to say like, that's so obvious. obvious we're on yeah. a podcast, but yeah, I assure you, <laughs> there's a million other things you could have picked. And what if, and what <sighs> if, right? You know what? Speaking of a million other things, how about this? 
just spontaneous. <laughs> Man. We'll write this in so they can see. Okay. Can you see? Right, I'm not looking. No, That's it's okay. Anyway. It's your name. Okay. 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 Cool. They're going to say two. I think of a number between one and a hundred right now. You ready? Tell me when. When. You have it? Yeah. Now, before I write this down, I need them to know you just formed that thought at this moment. Nothing before, nothing after. In fact, you could change your mind at this very moment. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Am I allowed to change or not? Change right now. It, I or or can I keep it if I it's want to? It's done. I just wrote it down. It's on camera. Okay. Take okay. the pen. Oh, man. I think that you were, I don't want to say stubborn, but I think you didn't change after all, did you? No. I knew it. See, I could see in your <laughs> eyes. And you did a two-digit number, didn't you? <sighs> of course you did. It's a business. It's about growth. You're not doing low numbers. Tell us, what did you think of? Tell me and the people looking on camera that just saw me write it. What was that number? What are you thinking about? 22. Take a look. I think, I think we could see on the camera. I'm going to turn around so you could see. Oh I wrote down God, 22. No. <laughs> this makes no sense, man. And there's no, I mean, seriously, like for people watching this, there's no way that there was nothing I whispered. Like I was super careful. Obviously, you can't tell me how you know this, but maybe there's some things. Stick you around until the end of the podcast. That is, that is mad, man. Okay. Thank you. So look, look, the first one, podcast, is obviously an obvious thing. We're on a podcast. You it's think that, that, but I'm telling you that people, shockingly, it's not as obvious as you would think of because yeah. that, that, that's kind of, in hindsight, hindsight's always twenty twenty. People will say, I pick the number 68. Does everyone pick 68? And I say to them, no. And they go, it must be. It's, you know what I mean? In your mind, you think what's topical. So if it was dinner time and you just had ramen, then you're thinking ramen. You go, oh, I shouldn't have picked that. I just had that for dinner. But I couldn't know that that's what you would think of. In fact, I would tell you most people would say the obvious is the least predictable. To be in a room doing a podcast and for you to have thought of a podcast is too obvious okay. to go with. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking it's obvious, but then I was like, okay, I was just thinking. And that's what made you change your mind, yeah. Oh, man. This is already crazy. All right. Are we, have we got some more we can maybe do? No, just in a little bit. <laughs> All right, we got, I'm yeah, going to yeah, fry your brain. Yeah, that's You're not right, going to do the interview. Well, listen, that, well, look, this is, this is already, I don't even know where to start right now because I'm, <laughs> I'm overthinking now. I'm like, I'm like thinking of the probability and I'm thinking, you know. Anyway, so that is, that's a great start. So Thank you. Less, um, people watching at home, I'm probably red or like brownie red. <laughs> <laughs> brownie <laughs> I'm red. I'm like still uh, thinking like what's going on. Um, but look, so we've kind of painted a picture of what you do, your background. But let's go back a little bit because, you know, you weren't always a magician slash mentalist. Let's say mentalist, but just people are aware of what... Magic is kind of like what you build from. It's a foundation. It's th that was the beginning, right? So like, take me back to that because I, I also read you were a really smart kid. You got like a perfect SAT score for in math. Yeah, I was good at, at like math. Like 12, 12 years yeah, old. Yeah, that's about something. right, yeah. So you... Do you think that has any relation to what you're doing? Obviously, intelligence and being quick enough to be able to read things. But like in terms of actual math ability and what you do, do you think that's, that's part of the game? I think um, I, two things going for me. Well, probably a few things. But one is I was very imaginative. So I was just a daydreaming type kid all the time. Had things like going through my head. Do you know what I mean? A brain that doesn't stop in terms of, I don't know. I just had kind of ideas, stories. I loved reading science fiction. I was just a big nerd. Yeah. And I said was, <laughs> but my wife will say is like, I don't know if that's a past tense. And so combine that with um, a slightly obsessive compulsive personality where I get very into things. If you get me starting on something, I don't really half ass it. I really jump in, you know, right into the deep end. So it was great for problem solving. The, the math thing that I'm good at is good at problem solving. I enjoy problems and solutions. And that's really, to a big degree, what magic and performance is, or at, at this level it is. Same as comedians that get obsessed. I really see myself most in line with a comedian as to any other entertainer, where they're constantly trying to figure out what's the tightest I can script this. How do I make the joke punch? How do I get the most laughs per minute? Right? They're analyzing humor in a way. I'm analyzing how to fool you while entertaining you. Yeah. So it's a little different. And I, I want my show to be funny. Yeah, yeah. But... Um, that's really what it is. It's, it's dissecting the human mind. Yeah, I love that comparison with with comedians because my favorite form of I like most art, but like to me, comedy in its purest form, like stand up comedy especially, is just like unbelievable. And now seeing like behind the scenes, I watch a lot of, I listen to a lot of podcasts by comedians and and watch some of their shows and um, just seeing like what really goes into creating like an hour special. Unreal. Like it's 
two years work, right? And you're going to the comedy clubs every week, like four or five times a week and testing out jokes and changing one little bit and seeing the reaction. So I'm sure yours is even more so in terms of how precise it needs to be because if you mess up a joke, you just, you just messed up the joke. Right. If you mess up on... Um, yeah, a trick. It's a different yeah, story. Trick. Like, if, like I was just thinking when you said 22 there, I was like, we're recording this. We're not going to go back and be right. like, oh, no, it didn't work. Like, you know. Bilal didn't tell you we've done this 98 <laughs> yeah, yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. finally got it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But you're, and I was just thinking, man, like the, d d just let's go into that feeling, though, because I feel like that's a part of why you do this. So it's, that it's rush. the iterative nature. That's what I call it. It's kind of like, right, right, mm. lather, rinse, repeat, almost the way shampoo. So with a comedian, the big difference is comedians, most of them, the ones that you see at the top of the game, like the top 10 people, they are going through material. And once they release the material, it's dead, right? They can't retell the jokes. So the one good thing about my profession is it's, there's, there's maybe 30 different routines or kind of premises. That's it. There's 20 to 30. Some people tell you less. Some people tell you barely more. It's all packaging. It's how you spin it. Because my whole profession is somehow knowing things that I couldn't know and finding interesting ways to reveal that. And th that's it. Versus in magic, you can make things disappear, up here, change color, or like float, uh, animate. There's, there's, there's a whole set of literature to all the different things you can do. In mentalism, it's much more limited. So you get much more creative with how you do it because otherwise the show gets very boring. Yeah, because there's only so many things. I get what you mean. So do you go in like the archives and see like this was done like 100 years ago and now I'm going to reinvent what was... All the time. Oh, there's that? a guy yeah, named Animan okay. who was one of the original mentalists. So it's been around but not as far as you would think. Magic has been around for thousands of years um, versus mentalism is a, little more, is a little more new. The same way that mesmer with hypnosis. Some of these things are in the last, the modern era, if you will. And so mentalism became, it built off of psychics, right? So a lot of fake psychics from the past hundred years, they employed techniques that mentalists were doing. And if you really think about it, I, I could pass myself off as a very, very capable psychic with most people because I can know what they're thinking in a certain way. Rather than a number, you do a name, you tell them what this person you know, means to them, stories about them from their past, things that are gonna convince them that you are somehow in touch with the dead or doing things which, if your ethics are, are okay with it, which I guess some psychics are that do a, kind of a poor job of mentalism, they're okay with it. They think they're providing a value. But Do you think there are, talking to psychics, like, do you think there are, what's your whole take on that? Because I've heard you talk about intuition. Right. And uh, you, you found out later in life or you knew that you had like a twin or That's something? That's true, yeah, 100%. Right, so, uh, was that you found out later in life or you always knew? No, so I found out when I was 12. Okay. But you could also call that a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's kind of like when people yeah. have something and there's survivorship bias. But I truly believe that I had something in me, but my sisters are twins. Mm. And I was always convinced somehow on a weird note level that I had a twin or that I wanted to be a twin or just, I don't know, yeah, something strange. And then when my mom told me, it was That's it weird. Was wild. So, so you, you believe in intuition and you believe in... Do, do you believe in someone being able to be a psychic? So I... Don't, I've never seen someone that's convinced me of it yet. And when you hear secondhand stories and you, they're like, well, explain that. I go, well, explain my show, right? People are just going to be as impressed. I don't see everything that goes into it. Yeah. Unless I'm physically there and seeing if I can spot it. Also, there's things that I do that will blow your mind that were pure luck. They were really? pure luck. And you're just seeing a very capable performer. It's kind of like a comedian that tells a joke that's an ad lib. And it's the funniest joke in the world. And then you go to the next year, you're like, why don't you do that joke? And you're like, because it was in the moment. Oh, right. It was pure luck. And it's knowing how to embrace luck and create your own luck. So a lot of things I do tip luck in my favor, right? If you had to pick a number one in 100, it seems like 1% chance, right? But what if I could tell you that I could narrow those odds down tremendously to about 1 in 10 or 1 in 8 just based on linguistics, based on speed of delivery, based on so many factors that seem like it's impossible. It seems like, no, no, I had a free choice. It goes, no, you didn't. You don't understand how much goes into a selection marketers, people in casinos, there's, there's a whole industry built around knowing the way people think and how they generally make decisions, decisions. because that's what marketing is. Yeah, think is. about the apps. There's so many analytics now that go into online businesses where they know that if you put something in your cart and if you didn't purchase it within X amount of time, they see a drop off of 70, 80% because you're going to forget about it. The advertising went away, you wormholed somewhere else. So what kind of pop-up can they do to bring you back? And how now there's so much metrics, analytics for yeah. it. It's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy, man. And and I know you obviously can't share like how you knew I did got pick 22. Right. But just like even 
um, whatever you're happy to talk through at least is just like, I'm assuming since you walked in this room, you've been analyzing subconsciously and consciously, like the way I'm acting, the way I'm speaking, everything, right? But like I'm trying to find moments. Moment, okay, that's how you describe it. I like so like obviously you can't say like what went into knowing that would be 22, but is there like types of things that you were looking out for that would help? Figure totally. That out? I mean that that's the craft, right? It's it's kind of like a. You ever see those shows, Iron Chef, and all the shows where they give you three ingredients and you're like, here, use marshmallows, scallions, and 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 you know baking powder and make me a meal, and you're like, what the hell? So I think it's very similar. I've spent decades learning an arsenal of tools. And then I get into the kitchen and my kitchen is more of what can I do in this environment, in this setting to quickly create a moment. And so it seems a lot of the time as if, oh, my God, you just did this on the fly. No, I'm debating doing one of 100 things and what will work right now in this moment with this person. What is the highest likelihood of success? And there's it's. It's something that I can't really explain because it kind of comes instantly over time as to what should work in that moment. Yeah. And um, like how often does stuff not work? So it doesn't work some of the time, but I, it depends on how high the stakes are, right? If I'm on TV and it's national, it's live, and there's, let's say, 3 million or 15 million people watching, stakes are much higher for a mess up than if I'm doing a stage show for 500 people. Also, if I only have three minutes to connect with you, you better not mess up. If I have a 45-minute show and I mess up, it actually makes my show better because it humanizes you. Mm -hmm. Think of any act that you've ever seen that's dangerous. Like, for example, a person walking across a tight wire and they have that stick, you know, that they hold for balance. If they just walk across it very quickly and easily, you look and you're like, I could do that. That didn't look hard. You don't see the struggle. You don't see the struggle, but you don't feel it in your stomach. So the moment that that person shakes... (gasps) You feel it, right? It's visceral. It's actually, you literally feel it. So in my show, when I, if I ever just tank something, I just get it wrong. It's jarring. It's a physical level jarring where people go, wait a second. This isn't all set up. Like it's not, he, he wouldn't have tried to get that wrong on purpose. So it makes everything else seem more impressive, right? Because if I just said to you right now, do the opposite. Bilal, write down my number, one to a hundred. I'm dead serious. And you go, well, I guess I'll try it, but you write down 72 and I go, mine was 31. You're like, oh shit, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so until a lot of the time things look easy when people are very good at them. It's kind of like in the Olympics when you see people doing those dives, like three spins, da da da, and you watch and it just looks so easy. What they should do is bring somebody out who's never <laughs> trained to do to it compare. and just do a full spin, <laughs> belly flop, and you're like, oh, that's what it would look like if I tried to that's do it. That's true. That's true. You watch basketball and everyone just looks easy. Shooting every- it you're looks, like, oh, I can do that. It looks and you're easy. like, uh, maybe not. That's crazy. Um, you just talked about kind of a story arc almost there. And like I've had people on the show that have talked all about, you know, the hero's journey, for example, like a very common um, storytelling framework. Like are there, and, and in comedy, I've heard of people talk about, um, I forgot the word, but essentially like where your emotions are going up like this. And then there's like, you have to like release and then you have to go back again. And then there's this, there's this common pattern that you're often following to make the, the show better. Because one is obviously the tricks of the trade and like what goes in behind this. But like the other part is perfecting the performance. I so would say that's the most part. Okay. Because there's so many people that can do the tricks. What distinguishes you? What's going to set you apart? Um, it, it's really the emotional connection with an audience. Yeah. So if you were to ask me, what do I really do? What, what's my profession? The mind reading is part of it. But if you do that not correctly if you set it up as a challenge so if the challenge is that you come up and see me do a show and i'm pretty much advertising that i have a skill you can't do and i'm smarter than you and i'm better than you nobody's gonna like that right you leave and you don't so you have to feel like you learn something within the show that you experience something uh and have like an emotional connection and that's really where the mentalism is where i do a lot of things which are personal thoughts things that are important to people and kind of teach them a little bit about how their minds work as they're doing it so you feel like you picked up some of the stuff so in the show, my favorite moment is at the end of the show, someone's like, I, I think I know how you did this and this one, but all the rest, I don't know. I go, that's great. That's actually what I want. Yeah. If somebody just leaves and they go, oh, I don't know how you did anything. and done it, That's the wrong reaction. Because it's too perfect. Almost. It's it's Not only is it too perfect, but it, it doesn't capture you. Mm. If somebody is too unattainable, then you don't feel like you know them. For me, I could either go off on a path of being creepy because if somebody could honestly read your mind, I'm serious, like a superhero – that's very disconcerting and jarring. That would feel like an invasion versus if you're someone approachable and you say, I have a skill I've developed over 20 years. You could do it too if you were willing to put in the time and effort. 
here's a little bit of how I do it. Then you walk out of there leaving like, ah, oh, he did this and this, and I kind of get those, but the rest were, oh my God. And that's what I want because now you feel as if you're a part of it yeah. instead of just seeing it, you were a part of it. You, and I like that in your show. Like I've seen you live in a room. We just did this and I've seen a bunch of your videos, obviously. But like you do that, you sprinkle in like, oh, this, I knew this, you're telling them. And yeah. then you realize, oh, okay, yeah, I did do that. Yeah. But obviously that's not enough for me to know how it all comes together. Exactly, but, but that's I'm, giving you, I'm giving you a taste. You're getting yeah. like the sizzle, not the steak. And when people get 10 or 20% of the pie, they still are blown away by the other 80%, but they feel more engaged. Yeah. Because when you watch a magic show, I don't mean to interrupt, but know. You, you know that there's a trick, right? When they cut the person in half and they put them back together, you know you're being fooled in some manner and visually it is impressive. But for me, there's a level of lack of satisfaction because I feel it's a puzzle. There's something you are doing that I don't know how you're doing, right? Versus if we do something like this, there's a, you, you're very aware that this could have not worked, right? So the, the, the amazing part of the enjoyable part is well, what would happen if it didn't work? And oh my God, how did you get it? And right, so there's some element where it's exciting yeah. because it might not always work. Mm. And that's, that's kind of the thing with a lot of mentalism. It hits you in more of an emotional way because it's about you. Watching someone in a box get cut in half isn't about you, but thinking of a number, thinking of a thought, thinking of a place or a person, those are all about you. Get it. The revelations relate to the audience. Yeah. So uh, take me back, man. Like take me back to the first time you said, I want to, like what captivated you with magic and like, you were like, oh, I want to do this, or I want to at least start learning. Like, when was that? How old were you? 13. 13. And it was, I, I saw a magician on a cruise ship. I had only been on the cruise once. We'd, I'd never done that before. And we went on a cruise. It was a big, kind of like my uh, present for my birthday, in essence, for my bar mitzvah, was to go on a cruise with my family. And there was this cruise ship magician. And man, it was just amazing. He brought me on stage. He did this one sleight of hand trick. It's called the Sponge Balls. It's a classic. And I was just, so blown away. I'd never seen anything like the it. The sponge never, balls. Is that like where it comes out? Yeah. It's where they usually take a ball and you have one and he has one, he or she. And then they put one in your hand and they take their ball and they make it disappear. It's gone. And then you say, open your hand and you have two balls. And it's like that, but it keeps growing. And it's, it's a classic. I did it for years. Most magicians have done it at some point. It's just, it's literally a classic. And uh, the first time I saw it was just mind blowing. And I, I watched tricks and this poor guy was stuck on the cruise ship with me. Like you can't escape. <laughs> and you even though it's a big cruise questions. ship, I was just trying to look for him everywhere. <laughs> I'm like, let's go to the buffet. Let's go to the pool. Where is this guy? That's hilarious. Yeah. I was probably so annoying, but I, I think I saw him two or three times. I got back. I bought books on magic. I went to the library. I, I started really consuming. So that's a key point though, because a lot of, so anyone who watches a show that's good yeah. is in awe. Like, oh, like I've done it a thousand times. Like. That was amazing. Right. But most people then don't go home and then go to the library and get all the books and essentially take action in what they want to do. Right. So was there a conviction in you that said at that moment, this is what I want to do? Or it was just you obsessed? Like, do you remember what it felt like? I wish way? I could remember mm. and analyze. Like it's, so it's funny. I think that it was a confluence of timing. So a lot of people will say something similar where if there's like strife in the family, so my folks had gotten divorced right okay. around this time. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of stress in the household. And I think that magic filled a void where it was a great way to kind of take your energy. I think some people, like, let's say they get sober if they're in drugs or alcohol. And what do they then do? Get very into fitness, right? So, or they, they have to take that addiction and put it elsewhere. So I think this was a great way to not deal with all the emotions and all the stuff. And you're a teenager and all these other things. And this was a great way to plow all my energy. And it was, I'm talking like hours and hours every single day. Uh, also in magic, it's mostly male dominated. It's mostly guys that are older than you that are kind of, I didn't know that many teenagers did magic. So I had call it father roles, people that I could hang out with a lot and they would show me more tricks and I would kind of try to win them over and get more. So I think there that was makes a lot of sense in yeah. hindsight, when I look back at it as an adult and now having two young children, like I see it that way where this was a great, perfect timing. And maybe if I was saw that two years earlier and I was 11, it wouldn't have been as interesting to me. Do you know, there's no way to know. Yeah. It's hard to know. I, did I think at the time, hey, I want to do this for a living? No, yeah. not at all. So then we can fast forward a little bit. So you, you went to college. You were obviously a really smart kid. Um, and then you got a job in Wall Street. Yeah. Right. And you were working, was it Merrill Lynch? Merrill Lynch. Or, so, you, you know, a big bank. Uh, what were you doing there, actually? Was that so I was a, a global technology and services department. Okay. So I was kind of a project manager who handled all their servers, their Unix servers. Okay. 
glorified title for somebody who was just a pain in the ass to all the people I worked with. <laughs> like you came to me and you were a developer, so you're trying to create applications for the company, and I'm some 22 year old twerp who doesn't know anything. And you're you know probably in your 40s or 50s with 20 years of experience and saying we need two million dollars for this, this, and this. I ask you all these questions. I'm the red tape. I go, we'll give you 800,000. They're like, you, oh, you know, oh, most my. people hated me. My okay. job is one, it's kind of like customer service. Nobody calls you to say we're happy. Yeah. We're like, fix this thing that's broken, buddy. So my sweetener was that I would then go do magic for all these people at happy hours and meet up with them. So it kind of, it softened the blow of the fact that most of these people kind of hated my guts because I'm messing up what they want. And I'm the red tape. I'm bureaucracy. That's all I am is bureaucracy. And they end up loving me because I did magic for everyone in the company all the time. All you were always doing it on the side then, through so school. In my younger years before now, when I kind of work a lot, and I think there was a big change, I'd say in my late 20s, where I didn't perform as often when I wasn't professionally performing the way I used to, I would perform all the time. I mean, all the time. If we were out in a bar, I'm getting all free drinks. Really? Oh, all, wow. all the time. Yeah. I'm Anywhere I'm going, I'm performing. Because it's kind of like having a superpower. You can go anywhere, bring joy to people, freak them out, be very memorable, build instant rapport in a way where in five minutes, uh, strangers are hugging me and saying, oh, my God, and want to go out with you. And you know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, it's something that transcends language almost. A moment of amazement. I've done it in over 40 countries. You That's can't. Crazy. You don't speak the language. I do something where I make something disappear and people go, oh, you know, they're blown away. What's the craziest reaction you've ever had? Is there one that stands out? I've got it. I mean, there's there's quite a few. I could tell you one that was in Amsterdam where I went to one of those hash bars and somebody was on mushrooms. You reminded me of this drinking yeah, this little mushroom this, uh, lion's, lion's mare. mare. Yeah, yeah. So this guy wasn't taking lion's mare mushrooms. These were the real deal psychedelic mushrooms. And I just go into this place. I'm an American. I'm by myself. And... Um, I start doing some tricks for these people and they're like, yo, our, they're all stoned. They go, our buddy's on mushrooms. Do something for him. Yeah. And I do a trick that's designed for, not, not I, won't, I don't want to say for that, but it's really designed as a strong visual where I have you take a card out and you hold it in your hand and I wave cards over it and a normal size card turns mini. It shrinks down to about an inch while it's in your hand. So I, I waved and the card shrank in his hand. The one he picked went from a five hearts. It was this big to a five hearts while he's holding it. And he looked at it and he blinked his eyes and he looked around and then he dropped the cart and he ran out of the bar and they couldn't find him for hours. That's and I felt really bad, but I think it was just, it just Do you know what happened shattered his worldview. No, I had to go. I flew out. I was there for like an hour and a half. That's crazy. It was amazing. My changes. I hope for the that good. he hears this podcast. And yeah. I remember that guy 15 years ago. Was he a Dutch guy? Oh, just like oh, a no, tourist. no, no, Americans. Oh, Americans. Because I was, I was an American in there, and so you kind of go in there and never really. I thought it would be fun to go in there. This is, you know, like a, you could smoke weed in Amsterdam. I, had, I was very excited to go check out these bars. Everyone told me about it because it's very. It wasn't legal in the states, and it was very taboo. And I don't know, I'm 23 years old. I thought, oh, let's course. go check it out. If you're gonna go, you're gonna check it out. Um, that's hilarious, man. What about um, if you don't mind me asking, like at school and college, like. Uh, I've heard you mention this in another interview somewhere. Yeah. You talked about the world of pickup artists. I was the ultimate wingman. Yeah. so More so for other people than myself, but, to be honest. But the reason that's interesting is because in that world, so for people that have never read the book, The Game by Neil Strauss, uh, that kind of like showed this underground world of pickup artists where yep. people were teaching each other how to essentially pick up girls. Or right. I think it was men, right? Yeah. So, um, and But really what's interesting, of course, there's the good and bad that comes with all of that sort of world. But like if you look at that and even reading the book, there's so much of it is about human psychology, social dynamics. Yeah. I mean, all of it is. The book's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So when you take away some of the, you strip out some of the stuff that I think Neil Strauss even since then is called misogynistic. Yeah, and now yeah. we're in a different era. Completely. Yeah. But like if you look at the way they quantified human behavior with the like indicators of interest, things that you do moving forward, telling somebody that when you walk up, honestly, most people should think of their lives as a sales call. If you take your interactions on a daily basis and think of a sales call, because when you cold call someone, what, what do they instantly want to do? They want to understand who are you? What do you want from me? Are you crazy? Do you want my money? There's all these questions that cycle through their head in a blur. So I used to work at restaurants doing magic. That is my, that is my 10,000 hours, the Malcolm Gladwell. From age 14 on, I worked at restaurants. And think about when you go to a dinner, do you want, in my case, some little kid coming up to you and doing tricks? No, you, there's so much awkwardness when somebody walks up to your table and you're having a meal. 
for a lot of these people, maybe they don't go out to eat every yeah, day. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like their mom. They've tried. They're, maybe they're paying a babysitter to be with their significant other, and they've got someone coming up to them. So absolutely, you be good absolutely. But it even goes beyond good. So good is one part of it. I would say that as you walk up, there's a checklist of things you need to analyze in their mind, what's going through their head, and how do we diffuse all of these situations before they present themselves? Instead of it being if then, kind of like a computer coding thing, if this, then this, you need to know the if before it happens. So I'm aware that when I walk up to you, the first thing in your mind is, who is this person? Are they a part of the restaurant? Do they want my money? Are they any good? Are they gonna leave? I'm gonna answer all five of those questions for you in less than 15 seconds without saying them, or, or if I do, it's very subtle. And then we're gonna flip the script. So the dynamic's gonna change very quickly where no longer is it that you don't know if you want me, it's gonna be, I don't know if I want you, and now I might leave before you want me to end. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm gonna change the whole dynamic. Mm. Like, that's very much like, you know, you talked about the pickup artist stuff. I, like, that's the, exactly the pickup the artist same. is the first thing that ever quantified with terminology, things that were internal to me from working at restaurants and for years. Because you know, like, we all know that when someone is being extra needy, texting you all the time, you don't wanna necessarily text them back straight away. We know that intuitively, but we still do it, right? right. Like, and it's, it's funny because when you apply that to this, you could also apply this, like you said, the sales call, the business world, negotiation, and there is an element of, like I wish the whole world was so straightforward that we could all just be straight up to the point and just not, not play any games in that way. But often you do need to be thoughtful about how you conduct yourself, right? Well, it's, there's no such thing. It's a zero sum game. Why are certain people billionaires and others aren't, mm -hmm. right? What if they, there's not, it's not a level playing field. Yeah. Certain people are able to leverage others. Not all those people are generally smarter. I don't think intelligence is a direct factor. It's the word leverage because you have to scale. Any business, anything you're gonna do in life, you're gonna have to grow off other people that look up to you, that you lead them, right? I mean, these yeah. people that have created businesses. So you've, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, but so mine in my case is not, I wish that was the case. I can't really leverage. My whole business is service oriented where I'm the product. So unfortunately I can't have a million clones of me. There's some ways I can have passive income, but in my situation, when I go up on stage or when I'm performing, I'm very aware of how to diffuse all those things instantly. And if I don't, I learn from it, it's, it's iterative. But if I'm coming up and approaching you like I did at that party, that's something that you've, that I've probably done, you know, 50, 60,000 times before I'm trying to think, but so many times for so many years that I can, and my eyes are darting. There's mm. so much information coming in that's, not even the trick, just the soft social skills. Yeah. Does that ever get exhausting for you? It's, or it's, it's just very you love it so in much. the moment. I think it's the same way a singer, a musician. It's okay. very, I'm more hyper-focused during a performance than any other part of life. Other parts of life is just kind of in and out, but there I'm aware of everything. It's kind of, when you see Jason Bourne in the first movie and he's sitting down, he's just, you know, he's like, how do I know that that guy's this and this woman's that and that if I could right now run away, I could, do you know that, do you know that yeah. scene when he's sitting there and he's discovering who he is? He's like, why do I know all that? I'm not born, I'm not killing people, but when I'm on stage, I'm aware of what's going on in the third row with this person and this person and that person, this person's changing their mind, let's maybe get them involved. There's so much multitasking. Yeah, so are there things that people listening to this, um, first of all, this is fascinating, like this is amazing, but just like, you clearly have a talent, right, as well, but it's something like you said, the 10,000 hour rule plus, you know, 50,000 hour rule for you. Right. Like you've spent 20 years working on this, right? And maybe people listening to this don't necessarily want to become a mentalist or a magician, right. but they do want to improve. Everyone listening to this can improve their own lives by being better in social situation, getting what they want out of a situation, not in like a manipulative way, but like if you're going in to negotiate with your boss to get a pay rise, or if you're in a deal and you're trying to get the other person to, to do something that you that they're saying they don't want to do, right. or you're managing people and you want to inspire them to uh, take action in, in their own way, like these are all the sorts of things you need to be able to take in, right? those social cues and stuff. So there, are there things that people listening to this could learn totally. uh, that, that you might be able to share as examples? I think you have to find ways to reframe social dynamics, which mm. is gonna sound very buzzwordy, but think about this. In a movie, yeah. the director points the camera, right? So you know where they're pointing it at. So in my show, I'm highlighting certain things that are gonna look amazing. Great example, I did a show recently, and at the end of the show, one of the people who already has what I would describe as social proof, he's at an event of mine, I, uh, so right away, it's not like somebody walking up to me off the street. 
and he's very good at his job and, and he says, hey, I want to get together for, I want to call you after this. So I'm going to take that call, of course, because I think it's for business for me, right? Maybe he wants me for a show or something. So we take that call. Turns out he's trying to sell me something. Do you understand? Which was like life insurance or who knows what. But the fact that you, in that situation, I'm very friendly and open because, hey, maybe it's for me. And then it turns out it's something that they want for themselves. But the way he was able to get that situation set up is based on, like I said, social proof, it, it, improving kind of the dynamic of the situation and how you use it to your advantage. I think in a lot of places when you walk in, if you're selling and if you don't think you're selling, you're wrong. I don't care if you're a teacher, you're selling your, you know, your, your advice, the, yeah, your education. Everything is some form of you're selling a perspective or selling a product or ev any profession almost deals with other people. Yeah. Very rare pursuits, even if you're a research you know, chemist, you, you've got a boss or someone you report to. How do you sell your ideas to other, to other people? And a lot of time, I think it just comes down to building that rapport and, and, and creating an environment where people trust you and like you. Uh, it, it's like Dale Carnegie's book has been instrumental in my entire life. How that one, yeah, just, yeah, very old book, classic, but classic, but it's the best way to go about it. And, and I don't know, I, I, I think that as a mentalist, I'm keenly aware of when I get into a social situation, how to take away tension that people will have um, regarding what I do, regarding other people I've seen that do what I do. Um, yeah, in your day-to-day -day life, I think a, a very important thing is analyzing where you stand in the social dynamics and, and making sure how to... Uh, I'm trying to word this properly yeah, yeah, because... Right. Yeah, keep going, but I'm going to yeah, think no, about no, how no. to... That's, no, that's, that's helpful. So you, you mentioned... Um, building rapport right and like th the book like i read that book when i was like 14 as well right. and uh and it was this one those foundational books that i feel like anyone anyone can gain from that book even though when you read it sometimes it sounds so obvious but often the most insightful things are obvious right, right? because you they're relatable like it says i think one of the things i remember is remembering people's names or using sure. their first name because everyone likes to hear their name right and and uh, like that's one of those things where you hear it, you're like, yeah, of course that makes sense. Um, but when you see it written out in a prescriptive format like that, it really helps give a framework, and and I think it's really helpful. You, you've I've heard you talk about names specifically. Yeah, well, until you realize 80 or 90 percent of people don't do it, so yeah. it does set you apart if you use names quite frequently. Uh, it sets you apart considerably if, in a situation, you're able to engage multiple people. And it you shift the conversation to be about them rather than about you as often as possible. Yeah. And the way that I remember names, I've kind of explained this before, is not so much mnemonic hooks. I'm not doing a big, some people do that, they create a story in their head. I make sure that I hear the name properly at least twice and repeat it at least twice. Most people don't remember the name because at the moment they meet someone, there's so many other things going on in their mind. They're in that yeah, moment, yeah. you lose track. Yeah. So if you, when you're shaking someone's hand and meeting them or saying anything, are thinking of what you're gonna say next, you're not capturing that name. You're not capturing that moment. You need to take away everything that's distracting you, look them in the eye, make sure you hear the name, repeat it, give a compliment associated with the name. Those are all things to, to capture that name and make sure you have it in your head. Well, we'll, we'll come back to some of those things a little bit later again. Yeah. Um, but let's go back to the story, man, because I love this story of you being in restaurants. I'm trying to think of you as this kid, yeah. uh, like going up to random strangers and learning the trick to the trade. Um, and that helped you pay through college. But let's go to um, Wall Street. So you told us about your job there. Now, there was a pivotal moment for you, right? Like, le could you share like what happened um, when you were doing like a party for, for the bank itself? So yeah, I did, a, I did a lot of events within the bank. And then what happened is they have event planners that create these, these you know, various meetings, client dinners, what have you, senior leadership dinners. And somehow word circulated to one of them and they go, oh, let's hire this guy, called me up, hired me, did a show. Now, they mostly don't hire internal. You know, it's not like a talent show within <laughs> Merrill Lynch. Yeah. So I go do Merrill something. Merrill Lynch got talent. Yeah, <laughs> M-L-A-T, great one. So um, I don't know how this happened even. I'm trying to remember back in time what led to what but it's serendipitous i end up doing something for the second in command the cfo and he's an australian guy and i do a trick and it's a magic trick where i turn ones into hundreds to this day i do it's great trick i just did it on cnbc recently it's very visual and it, it always brings up the same joke which is oh my god you got to do it with my money or in this case they go hey you should come work for us like as if you know run to port run the portfolio and i made a joke and i go i do work here and he thought i was just you know joking around 
And then I, I went, no, no, seriously, I, I do work here, sir. I work at your global technology services. And he's like, well, what the hell are you doing working here, mate? And it was very funny because certain things like that, little comments that people can have can just give you a huge boost where I go, what, what am I doing working here? And I was right at a moment in my life that was a bit of a pivotal, do I go for this? You know, it's, it's something to do, something a little risky when you're going to give up a guaranteed check. Paying job. A paying yeah. job, a good job that's paying well. Uh, and, and go for something where there are necessarily no guarantees and no one's going to go out there and hustle for me. I have to hustle things up myself. Yeah. How old were you at this this age? Uh, 23. Okay, so you were yeah. fairly, fairly Very young. young. Very and young with very few responsibilities. Yeah. Lived with a girlfriend at the time. Rent was not outrageous. So also timing, it was everything in life. This is in 2005. Had this been 2009 or 2010... Who knows? Because at this point in my life, I said, what's the worst case scenario? I crash and burn. I get another job. I'll just go back and look for another one. Right. It didn't seem like yeah. I'm throwing my life away. That's such a good. I'd love to go into that point a little bit more because a lot of people listen to this have or people I know have, have talked about uh, one day I'm going to do this. And I'll say for my own personal experience, I've said that for 10 years and yeah. I actually left my full time job in January. So I've wow. been on this strat, uh, yeah. this whole uh, new path being self-employed, doing a bunch of different things. And it's been amazing, but it comes with a lot of mental struggles as well, sure. uh, right? And if you're not ready for that moment, and obviously this is, you know, not everyone can do that, right? Like if you're a, um, I'm just making this up, but like a single mother with seven kids yeah. and you like can't afford to do that, of course you shouldn't do that. But, you know, d like talk me through that in a little bit more detail if you can, because I feel like a lot of people think about this moment of making a change. It might not even be quitting their job. It might be changing their job. I was right. talking to my friend this weekend who's been, I used to work at Google and he's been there for 10 years, right? And he was like, oh, I'm so comfortable and, and like I want to do something else, but I'm not. So it's just like, I loved what you said there, which was, what's the worst that can happen? And I've, right. that's been said on this show several times by people that have gone on to do great things. And like, is there anything else you would advise someone who's in that moment? So yeah, I, again, it's very difficult for me because I've lived a very lucky, entitled life in the sense that I have a roof over my head, I have food, uh, I've never gone hungry. There's so many things that, you know, right away, set yourself up in a first world benchmark that yeah. you're already so lucky. Definitely. But taking it in stride from that point on, everyone's gonna have responsibilities, everyone's gonna have different times in life. But in my mind and going back, security is always great and having something there, but if you're in a situation where you're miserable every day, what's the value to that versus your life? I don't know. That's a very difficult thing to do. I think so many people don't realize that if you're fully committed to something, there's tremendous hours in the day. Most people squander most of them. And, and I'm guilty too. Everybody does. You're doing other stuff. Watching you're not house of cards. Anything you're <laughs> wasting time on. There's so many things that if you are fully focused and committed, the people that rise to the top are generally the ones that work the hardest, work the hardest find other people to mentor them that reach out to people they want to become. So if I looked at someone, a lot of it is having a role model. So I had, I don't, don't want to say have a role model, but somebody that you can visualize as doing what you're already doing and want to be in five to 10 years. Like I saw a few other magicians that were making a living. And at that time I had kind of a, a numbers game. I'm like, if I can do this many shows for this as much money, I'm going to have this much and I can earn an I didn't really think beyond the monetary level. Who levels. was that uh, magician that you looked at? There were a few. Oh, okay. There were a few other guys that I did what I would call overflow shows for them. So if, oh, if, if you get a call for a Saturday night, if you're more in the private party market, which I used to be, then you can only be one place. That's the downside to being you know, the magician. So what you'll do is you'll farm that work out to someone else. You'll give them the show and make a commission or a cut. Okay. And so those people would book me. And the, this is somebody who was 10 years ahead of me in the game, who'd been doing it for 10 years, was already professional, and had rolled that snowball down the hill where they are growing their business and people knew them already, right? Every event for me gets me more events. I have no marketing. Other than being on TV and being at events, I don't advertise. Now, some people do, a lot of people do, and I might, it might be something I will do one day, but right now, the volume of events I do and the number of people that see me at those events, they then call it, if it's a 1% conversion rate, if I perform for 100,000 people a year, that's still 1,000 people calling me, right? That, that, that's kind of, it's a numbers game. Everything in life's a numbers game. So that's been my business model from day one is be exceptional and have as many people as possible see you and target effectively. So I really, what you said branding earlier, I came to the conclusion early on that I have something that 
almost nobody else does in my field, which is intimate knowledge of corporate America and the financial services sector, more so than anyone that does what I do, period. Like, that's why I'm on all the networks, like CNBC, Fox Business. They call me the Wall Street Mentalist. I know a lot of these people's business inside and out, not just buzzwords and terminology. Like, I know how these hedge funds, private equity firms, like, I know how they do their work and how they generate returns. So when I get in there and they hire me, they love the fact that this is someone who almost feels like one of them. And it just so happens that's an industry that has tremendous amount of events and tremendous amount of capital to invest. And they want to look like stars as well, right? Like, um, or they don't even know necessarily, but I, I've heard you describe this before that when someone books you, your job is to make them and the audience basically feel, I mean, obviously the audience, you want them to have a great time, but like that person who booked you looks great to their team and the people That's that- it. I want to be the easiest person you've ever worked with, the most low maintenance, and for you to know it's a home run, for you to leave and have everyone that walks out goes, where did you find this guy? Oh my God. And that everyone has a mutually shared experience because think- a lot of these companies, when they have a, call it like escape the room, or you go paintballing, or you do anything where suddenly this one girl's got a new nickname, and you're laughing with somebody you didn't even know, and you just met them, and suddenly you have something that builds you up in, in a way that few other things do other than either a mutually shared experience that's dangerous, exciting, or unique, right? If you're trapped in an elevator with three strangers for three hours, you're going to get out of there, and you're like bonded for life, right? Those people that crash landed on the Hudson with that guy Sully, they have a party every year because every year is a blessing. They could have died that day, right? So I, I'm, my show's not any of those, but my show gives you something that you rarely get nowadays, which is moments of absolute amazement where you're just going, what the F? Yeah. And you don't get that anymore in a world where you're on your phone and anything you want, you can learn at the push of a button. Yeah, and that's actually a great point because I feel like any like amateur... Um magician yep. like if you go into their youtube comments and they put stuff on youtube like or even if you search reddit or something there's a bunch of people saying i know how you did it and so. they just they want to be the person that's like this is how you do it and i made a video to show you and often they're not actually right but it's just like how do you deal with that in your world where like people are always trying to figure that out and then in the past they might have told 10 people but now they can tell it to the whole world and youtube might recommend that as a video after your trick. Like yeah, that I, I, happens with the America's Got Talent clips. If you have any oh, clips really? that okay. get up in the millions, like I have a few clips, I don't know how much, but it's like five to 10 million views, you better believe that somebody will throw one of theirs up because if you've got 10 million views, they're gonna probably get 800 to a million views, 800,000 to a million views just having a reveal. So I get the, the, the and there's no way, to, yeah, the appeal, it's, I don't, so it's a tough one. It's kind of like market economics where if you outsource, someone's cheaper. Capital is going to flow to where it's cheapest. So here, if somebody has a, a way to do it, I don't knock them for it. There's no hard line ethics. I think that most people don't care enough. So if you're going to go there to learn how it was done, you're either someone who might actually get more into this as a craft in general. Because I, how did I learn? I bought books and videos and learned from other people. And what is there, a secret handshake? Not really. They don't tell you, hey, and give, give me the secret handshake for me to teach you the trick. It's more just showing that you have the passion and excitement. If somebody who watches my show then goes and wants to get figure out a few things, they probably can very easily. But that's a very one note show, one note. If you watch my show, it's gonna take you years to figure out how all of it works because so much of it is done where I go, here's how I'm doing this, here's how I'm doing this. And you're like, I think you did this here, but the next thing I do will exclude that method. I will literally say, this is how you think I just did it, right? So let's do it different this time. And now you don't have a clue. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, so I, 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 going back to the story here, so you you got this signal from the CFO of the company yeah. to say, why are you doing this? And you're like, yeah, well, why am I doing this? And I'd seen, like I told you, one of the guys that I worked with had, had given me, like just had said, well, what's the problem? I one, told, one time told him, he goes, what do you still have a job for? And I was like, well, I don't know. You know nobody, somebody had to really just say, ask me s super simple yes or no questions. He goes, well, what do you need to leave it? And I was like, uh, I guess, uh, I make six figures. Like I just kind of threw it out there and I hadn't thought of it but when I said it. And he goes, okay, what's the problem? And it was just so, you know, just cut right to the source. And I go, I guess, what is the problem? Do this, do hundred shows at a thousand dollars a year and suddenly you have it. He goes, well, what do you need to make that happen? I go, well, I gotta go get another restaurant. And when I do, I'll go this and I'll do this. And it goes, well, do it, right? So, so much of advice that I give people is, you know what you need to do. Everyone that needs to lose weight, they know what they need to do. Anyone that needs to quit smoking, they know what they need to do. None of these things are mysteries. Yeah. These self-help books. It's doing it. It's the hard part. It's doing it. It's yeah. setting in. You know what? 
it's the first two or three weeks. Mm. It's almost always the first two or three weeks. That's a true. diet, cessation of smoking, everything, breaking the habit, getting the routine going, where you uh, try to rewire your brain from the comfort zone, push away, right? It's muscle memory to do the things you normally do. And for me, a lot of it associated with entertainment is personal rejection. If you, for, mine was a hustle. If I go in and, and, and go to a restaurant and they don't want me, or if I go to a restaurant and go table to table, it, you take that personally, it's gonna, it's gonna eat you alive. If you're one of those people, I've seen people that are very talented performers, talented speakers, talented at anything they do, they don't have the stomach for the rejection. And it's a numbers game. If you think you're gonna go in and Britney Spears, I always think like the people that are teen stars, Justin Bieber, you think that they had one lucky break yeah. on Instagram or YouTube and that got them to the next level and one agent and they made them a star, that is total BS. Those people work their butts off. If they're a big star, they went through a ton of rejection. Yeah. They navigated those waters. So for me, a lot of it is you can't take the rejection personally. You need to separate yourself from who you are as the business or the entertainer. Like I'm the agent or the representative of my business. When I walk up to you, if you didn't like what just happened, that's not me. That was the agent. That was the representative. It's not me. So I don't get the emotional baggage of like, oh, man. That's a good distinction. I separate yeah. the two. Mm. Especially as a creative person. You have to. I feel to. like because, I mean, in any genre, if you want to call it that, but just especially creative because you're you're essentially trying to develop a show or something that people are going to see in its own format. And that isn't, that's one part of you. You're the creator, but you're not only your art. Your art is a part of you as the umbrella creator, right. if that makes sense. It's, um, it's not easy. Listen, I'll get out of shows and I'm just so mad and this didn't go right and this didn't go right, but you learn from it and you yeah. learn and take away because the, the best shows aren't the ones that teach you stuff. It's for me, it's the ones that mess up or things go wrong that you learn from and things improve. And yeah. I think that's the case in life with whatever business you're in. Yeah, for sure. So you, you quit your job and yeah. you're doing this. and. I love, I'm, I'm glad we went into that in a little bit more detail because what you just shared there before, which was, what's the end goal? And okay, I want to make at least six figures. If that was what you were earning before. That was at the time. Before, and you said, no, okay. more. Okay, yeah. So if, but you were saying, I need to make this, especially living in New York, the things are more expensive here than a lot of places. And you know that. And that's often the stumbling block for a lot of people. They literally say, like, oh, okay, well, I need to make, I mean, I just went through this, right? I said, okay, what do I need to spend every month? And I literally wrote it all down. And I said, okay, now I need to pay for my own health insurance, which is actually probably the hardest, scariest thing for me, especially right. as a European, where we have like free healthcare. And, you know, and I can just share, like I pay $550 a month. Yeah, it's outrageous, right? Healthcare, right? Yeah. And, and like, I'm a fairly touch wood, healthy 31 year old man. So, um, and, and it's just like, that mentally is if I just said, okay, well now I'm not going to do it because I'm going to have to like pay for my own healthcare. I would never actually like take any action and I'd be safe forever. Whereas when I just accept like mentally, I, I just say that's the price of admission. Like that's the way I describe it. There's some things like I love living in New York and the States. There's some things I don't like, but that's like everywhere. And for me, this is the price to admission to be in the biggest market. Like uh, there's a lot of upside for me from business and this, you know, even what I'm doing here, I would not be meeting you if I was in the middle of nowhere to, and have the access to you the way I did today. And that over time compounds. Like this, Absolutely. Is, not, this is not just about the interview and a few thousand people listening. This is about like a connection with you, what I learned from you. And for hopefully for 20, 30 years, we, I have a relationship. And that to me is worth 10 times more than you know uh, the podcast itself you have so, to make your own luck yeah you don't realize what things will lead to other things i give you a great just a great story when i was 14 years old this is i wish i could fact check this because it's like i don't know exactly what it was but it was one of the first weeks that i worked at this restaurant how did i get to the restaurant i walked it was half a mile from my house it was the nearest one it was an italian restaurant and i went there my dad came with me. I did some tricks for the person at the, at the hostess. Then I did some tricks for the bartender. And then the manager came over and we ended up, I don't know, I don't know how we come up with how much they're like, all right, why don't I come in one day? I want to do some tricks for the people here. I'm like, what do you charge? I go, oh. and I said, I don't know how we came up with it. We said 50 bucks for two hours, which was outrageous money, $25 an hour when you're 14 years old. So I go up and I start doing tricks and I start learning. I'm, I'm just, I go up to this one table. This is the second or third time I'm there. And these two women are having dinner, and they don't seem to like me at all. The reactions are muted. Okay, like I did stuff. And then 
I give her my business card and I, I still have my business card to this day. And she called me the next day and she said, we're opening up three national tire and battery stores. These are uh, it's corporate gig like, hey, and we're going to have the Detroit Red Wings at each one. And this is during the time when um, they had won the World Cup, uh, World Cup, the Stanley Cup. We were talking about soccer. Earlier, I got my head. They'd won the Stanley Cup. These are future Hall of Famers. At each one of these events, I got photos taken of me and these big hockey stars, huge ones. Dino Cicerelli, Stevie Eiserman, Nick Lindstrom, huge in this area. And that's in the paper. And suddenly, and I, I learned, you never know what opportunities are going to come from certain things and how to leverage them effectively. And that's really been the, the entire game in the last 10 years is opportunity comes up, leverage. You get something, use it for the next thing. Do not just let it... It's good and bad because you can't really enjoy the, the, the status quo, the present moment. I'm always thinking if something just came in, how do I get more from it? To leverage that. For how do I use this to get the next thing? Yeah, that's a great point because I, I, it's interesting you talked about luck because I think luck is such a complicated word and I almost try not to use it in many ways because I think some people have this negative connotation and there's always this split thing. Like, for example, I talk to my mom about this quite a lot and and she's, she would often say like, oh, that's so lucky, that's so good. And often for the person who's put in all this effort, they would say, well, yeah, but I created my own luck the way right. you described. But I've heard you also mention that luck and timing is impor really important in life. And Most it does, important. But like with luck, like I love the, the way you just described that because yeah, there are things out of your control. This is how I think about it. There's stuff out of your control, but at the same time, you can control half of it or 25%, whatever the number is. By going to a thousand restaurants, you're more likely to now meet more relevant people. And sure. and you you specifically went to high end restaurants in like Midtown and stuff like that where people might be there for work. And and that was smart, like that you were increasing your chances of the probability of something coming out of that. Yeah. And uh, I just another just to wrap that up that section, like a, a good learning for people listening here is just the fact that you mentioned like leverage. I love that because that's something anyone who's listening to this can can leverage for their own life right and and even for this podcast as an example before i launched the podcast i recorded 10 episodes and i got like amazingly massive people like gary vaynerchuk uh, jank huger from the young turks like scott harrison from chai to war these are people that i had no right to interview i had zero audience zero name and but once i got one i was able to go to other people and say hey oh i'm recording 10 in a row before i launch i've also got these people and right. those people say oh I know that person or I've heard of that person. I want to be associated with them. It's the, the play on the term social proof. Uh, Fully. It's exactly what it was. And I was using that to my advantage. But those are the things where, yeah, are there, are there things that are out of my control? A hundred percent, right? And I was incredibly lucky in many ways, but you also make your own luck. Uh, yeah, you set extent. yourself up for those moments yeah. that are going to be game changers. Yeah, yeah. And that's 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 really it. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I don't care if you're selling jewelry on Instagram, if you're a model, a dog walker, anything like that. You need to keep your eyes open for how to jump to another level if you want that. I mean, not everyone's as ambitious. I think that most of your listeners likely are. If you're looking at business growth, then you are trying to enhance something, something in your life, whether that's earnings related, have more time for your family, create a different level of lifestyle i mean any of those things you have to find a better way to utilize the hours in the day yeah for sure we all only have 24 <laughs> yeah exactly um l let's go into you talked about getting paid 25 dollars an hour yeah right i'm sure you charge a lot more than that by a this little point. bit yeah. a little thank goodness but, but that's a key thing when you go out on your own yep. it's especially in a services business right like you don't always know what your value is sure. and often people undervalue themselves in the beginning and they end up giving in because they're being too nice and they say, oh, that's my friend. And then that there's opportunity cost. Like I do this, I do consulting as well. Um, so I basically will work with clients and I know how much I can get paid in the marketplace. And then that's kind of how I work backwards. But then that doesn't mean a startup that I'm working with has the resources to pay me in the same way a big company does. Sure, enterprise. So, exactly. So. So how did you think about that? And I mean, that was just my really quick math uh, to say like, that's how I try to figure it out. And then you normally say a number and see if people, how they react. And over time, um, you'll get to a number that makes sense. H how did you work out your pricing and how did that evolve over time? So it's very industry specific because okay. I don't know the people that are listening, are they, if they're self-employed and they have a business, whether they're selling it themselves in essence, which is a service or if they're selling an actual product, yeah. right? I think with products, 
it's much easier to define because rarely are there products that are unique. In mine, it is somewhat unique. Also, it's a weird supply and demand curve where most of the time, if you have more demand, the supply will go up. And that kind of happens within my industry because it's mentalism has gotten bigger and bigger due to people being on TV. And so, but overall, the demand is much higher than the supply. There's just not as many people that are very capable and Especially good at, at the high end. At the high end. Yeah. That's the way I would describe it. Yeah. So I think I was terrible at pricing myself for the first 10 years. And a, a big part of the reason is if you're doing something you love, like imagine if somebody paid you to sit and watch Netflix. You'd be like, this is great. I'll take $3 an hour, right? I'm doing it anyway. So I, in my mind, thought I'd be doing this anyway. I would be doing this because I love it no matter what. And so that's when you're your own, own worst enemy and you don't value your services. If you are getting the word yes said to you every time you are quoting a price, you are under quoting, you're undervalued. You need to find, because right now you have a supply and demand curve, right? Just econ 101, where you're charging way less than what people are willing to pay you over and over and over. Now that could be fine with you, but again, it just depends what your trade off is, because now you're giving away your time for less money and you're gonna have less time for the other things in your life. You need to be hearing that word no to start getting a sense of where you lie in the pecking order and then start to figure out what makes me higher in the pecking order. In my industry, it's very clear cut. It's a lot of it is clout related and how good your marketing materials are. Because if people see you, if why do people spend 800 bucks on a Gucci t-shirt? Yeah. Ask yourself, it's made of cotton, it's not special. You it's, wear it, it's just like, it's because of everything associated with it. The stars, the, the cachet, luxury products. Luxury products have much more of a ethereal quality in the brand and they people want to be seen in them right so the same thing and what do you create that looks like you are going to be that high-end item unless you're more of a volume high quantity uh, lower cost and you make smaller margins and that's absolutely fine but very rarely is that fine if it's you especially in the service yeah. service industry because you unless you have an you. army of 100 people working under you mm. then again you kind of have a product at that point yeah um that's a tough one for me personally what i did the smartest thing i ever did was i no longer negotiate i don't i don't answer the phone anymore someone else does that for me i have a manager and now i'm not the person it's kind of like if you walk into a store you could negotiate with the person who owns a little bazaar right here in chinatown where they're like hey how much for this watch i'm like they'll say 20 bucks and i'm like how about 15. you can't do that at walmart because there's they don't own the store so you need an intermediary between you and who you're actually having at the end of the day, be the buyer, the consumers, that you're not bad cop, good cop. You don't have to be involved in the monetary portions. Yeah. If you can't do that or afford to do that, fake it till you make it. Get an assistant, get someone else to do the, the, the initial contact. Yeah. Do, do you have anyone else working with you or is it just you and the manager? Manager and an agent. And but the agent. manager What's does the, the What does majority. the agent do? That the agent more opens doors for TV things. Okay. For book deals, for things like that in agency. Um, I'm with CAA, so they oh, yeah, have... Yeah. They they're like have, the biggest one. Or, they're one of the biggest. Yeah. They're in WME. Yeah. But an agent, again, it, it's if you, it, it, it hurts and hinders you if you're with an agency that's too big, unless you're a very big A-list star, because they're going to have, if they're representing Bradley Cooper and yeah. Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez, and you know, then you're very low on the totem pole. Yeah. These are people that are booking $1 million shows. If you're booking $50,000 shows, they're not going to care. They make 20 times as much from one show from another person. That's a good point. Or one yeah. book deal. You can only get as much out of it as you put into it. You need to you need to be your number one champion. Like you need to be the person driving the conversation. No one's ever going to do it for you with almost no exceptions. No one else is going to suddenly meet you and create this big business for you and create make you a superstar, make you anything. You need to be that person for yourself. If somebody can help you add to it, that's great. But it's I've never relied on someone else to suddenly, you know, make my career. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's talk about America's Got Talent, man. I would love to just touch on the experience there because I, I watched last night. I've watched it like two years ago as well. Yeah. But like th there's a whole like 30 minute video on YouTube of like all of your stuff that you oh, did nice. on there pretty much. And it's like, it's amazing. Thank like you. I was uh, posting on Instagram. So many people responded to me to be like, oh, this is so crazy. Nice. You're doing this. And uh, it, it's one of those things where like, you know, how many people are watching that? It's like 15 million people. I think 15 million was at the finale, like the top. That's was crazy. Big. And, 14, and, then 15. and then there's millions that watch online. Later. Huge, huge viewership online, international too. That's the crazy thing. Like I've had offers for shows 
all over the world because of it. Where, yeah, yeah, like I did shows in Qatar. That's crazy. Like, they bring you in there. I've had offers all over Asia, very big in Asia, but I, some of them I've done, some of them I haven't. Yeah. How did that? Just share like a I little just bit about. You just went straight up to the straight audition. Straight up right? audition. So I auditioned twice. A few years earlier, I think it was three years earlier, I auditioned in what's called a producer call, which is much more of a red velvet rope. Yeah. You don't sit in a pier or in a huge arena with another few thousand people. It's just you walk in, come on in, Mr. Perlman. In 15 minutes, you'll be with the producers, and that went terrible, through through um, things that weren't under my control. Just the way it was set up was poor for my, it didn't play well for my craft, if that makes sense. Didn't get it. And then I came back, and honestly, I think that three years was a blessing, because in those three years, I did hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows, improved my act considerably, was more seasoned, more more professional, came back in and didn't really care. I, I had a pretty good business going into it. I went into it, honestly, I think there, there's been so much, I don't know if there's studies, but kind of evidence that's empirical about the fact that if you go into something and not caring if you go in tight and tense you don't perform if you go in loose and relaxed and you honestly you don't care if i get this great if i don't no worries and you nail it yeah and people feel confidence that. people well, right? feel that confidence they feel that lack of desperation or neediness versus if you go in there and you're so nervous and you're on edge they can sense it i went in there and i said here it is bam Take it or leave it, you know, and, and they took it. Yeah, I think also success brings more success, right? Because you've, in the beginning, when you're still trying to prove yourself, it's a lot of mental stuff you're dealing with. Like, am I actually good enough? Am I actually going to be a star? All these things I've built up in my head. And then when you actually say, like, oh, actually, I've done a bunch of shows. This this will be cool. It's right. a nice to have, but I'm already doing great. Then you come in with a different aura almost. Like, that's that's cool, man. Um did that like just take over your life, I assume, for like, is it several months? Or so the one good thing is it was in New York. Oh, okay. So it, that made my life much easier versus if it was in L.A. The first two episodes are not live, so they tape in advance. Okay. Then for months, you just sit there and kind of wait to see what's going to happen. Even though you know what happens, you can't tell anyone. You're under a very tight NDA. And then th once you make it, if you make it to the quarterfinals, that's live. That's how they're doing it now. So it's live, and it's at Radio City Music Hall. It was. Now it's somewhere in L.A., and that's very exciting and very, very focused. Like I've never prepared as much for shows or anything else that I've ever done as for those segments of America's Got Talent because you know what's riding on the line. At the time, I didn't really realize how I, I just kind of kept my eye on the ball where every round do as well as you can and don't plan for the next one. I never knew what I was going to do in the next one at all. Yeah. And so it was very kind of up and down at the same moment where if I'd get through, yeah. it'd be like, cloud nine oh my god and then the next minute crashing down of like oh my god i have to do better than this next round what am i going to do next yeah. and i like that i enjoy a pressured situation where there's a deadline and it forces your hand because otherwise i i don't do things do, do you think because you you've mentioned many times here like the next thing yeah. right and a lot of people i interview are people like that and i'm probably the same yeah but i've thought a lot about this and just do you think that actually makes people happier I don't think it does. So for you in particular, do you think like your DNA maybe is the, the type that wants to always do better, but like, can you then control that? If you think it doesn't make you happier, could you then pull back or like, are you just so obsessed that you kind of can't deal with that? It's tough because how do you gauge happiness? Right. Yeah. So I, for example, uh, I just look back and even five years ago, there are things that I've achieved or that were in terms of kind of clout, career success, monetary success that were inconceivable at the time. They yeah. were literally were because I just didn't know there was this these levels above that I could reach. And so it was kind of, it's, it's blessed, but like be careful what you wish for. So yeah. people have said that to me in the past where you, somebody will want to attain a certain level of success, but they don't realize that, that success comes with all these extra responsibilities. And for most people, they're not coasting. It's not a coasting where people say, I want to make X amount of dollars a year you're probably, if you start making that, going to be spending more. There's very few yeah. people that are going to live. Lifestyle creep. Exactly. Cool, yeah. Other things, lifestyle creep. Other things are going to create where now you want to maintain earning that. Right? And now it becomes a lot harder to fall back down once you've gotten used to something. But that can be across the board where in terms of once you reach a certain height, do you want to maintain? In which case you're slowly dying. De facto, you have money under the couch. That's inflation. That's bringing your money down. Or do you try to strive for something else? Uh, I've tried to enjoy the moment and be in it and really appreciate it. I think I do really appreciate things that are happening when I get them and when they happen and how lucky I am because I do what I love yeah, and get paid for it. It's, it's really, truly lucky in this world. 
Uh, but I think that if you're not hungry for the next thing, you're not going to have that killer instinct. You're not going to be the person who gets all those next things. Yeah. It's a great, I, I think, I always think of like great athletes as well. Like if you think of Michael Jordan versus, uh, you know, for basketball fans, m everyone knows who he is, but Michael Jordan was just the ultimate competitor, even now apparently. Like if you play like table tennis with him, he's going to take you down or he's going to keep playing. He's going to say, we're going to play one more, one more. And like that's kind of insane because uh, like apparently at his level, it's actually just unbearable if you're like just trying to chill out. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't want to be around him in that way. But that's what made him like what he became, right? So I think it just comes down to like what you actually want. And I think all, everyone generally thinks they want to be that person. Right. But my, uh, my own self-awareness is just that like I really want to be great in so many ways. Yeah. But I also want to be like I want to enjoy throughout. You have uh, to. And, and like I think it's so easy to just be, you know, running on the hamster wheel and the next thing and the next thing. And then. 30 years later, you're going to look back and say, like, why was I even doing that? And when you start digging into it, the human psychology part is normally there was like a hole there in the first place. And you didn't deal with stuff that you could have easily dealt with just by being a little brave. There's a lot of it is normally just family stuff, stuff that happened as a kid. 100%. Like, you know, and so did you ever like you, you, if you don't mind me asking, sure. you mentioned your parents like broke up when you were young. Did that impact you in a way you mentioned a little bit like looking for a father th figure, but. Is there any work you did mentally later down the road, especially for someone who knows so much about human psychology, to go and try to fix and plug some of those holes that might have been exposed as a kid? Because everyone has them, right? For sure. I mean, tons. I think that it set me up for success in a certain way where um, I needed to be self-sufficient. So my parents, when they got divorced, my mom moved back to Israel. That's where I was born and that's where she was originally from. And then a few years later, my dad moved back to Israel. And so at that point, I was not supported by my parents in any way, not in, in terms of anything. Like literally, they both went back to do their own things and uh, they had their own lives. And, and I was, that there was, it was a situation where I, at 16 years old, was done with high school, went to college. I gotta figure out where I'm gonna live and how I'm gonna pay these tuition bills. And so I think that was a very good sink or swim scenario where there really wasn't, um, like a plan B, like I, I had some businesses going, I actually installed and removed boat docks with the friends, I had the magic shows, and I knew no other way. So it wasn't a thing where, look at poor me, this, was, this, is, how I, this is how I do stuff, I multitask, I gotta get stuff done. And I think that was very, very helpful for my future, where a lot of other people that have said to me, oh man, so you got out and how'd you get this and this? I'm like, how did I do it? I had to do it. Like when I quit my job, day one where I'm sitting on my couch, I can't be here. Like, yeah. I, th this, no one's gonna start ringing me on the phone and saying, "Hey, do you want a magic show?" Unless I start going out. So, start going around, go to restaurants, find out who is doing the parties, who's doing the parties of all these rich people that I see all the time in New York City. Find those people, show them how great I am, win them over. Whether that means just in terms of them liking me, or whether that means we find some sort of mutually incentive beneficial process. Let's do it. Let's get get the foot in the door and be persistent. Follow up, follow up, follow up. No one's going to follow up for you. Th and don't take rejection personally. A lot of the time I have so many things that have happened for me that are like TV-based, success-based, where people just go and they go, oh, my God, how did you get that? You're so lucky. I'm going, no. There's almost no luck involved. These are relationships that I've fostered sometimes for over paint, a decade. You can see the dots, I right? have dotted lines. Like I was at a bar mitzvah in 2007. I kept yeah. in touch with this guy. He then got me this show where I met this person. This person introduced me to this person. That person runs ESPN. I tried for four years to get on. The fourth year, I finally got on. I killed it. When I went on, I did so, like, I'm going to come in and do the best thing I can possibly do. And I'm going to also have everyone there like me because not only do I do the TV spot, I will go up to everyone. Imagine right now, if right where we are in this podcast creator, what if I went to every one of these booths and performed for everybody? Right? That would be great. Well, think about it. <laughs> think about what would happen. The, the buzz that would happen about oh, yeah. it and the people that would say, hey, that guy was great that came in. He did your podcast and, oh, my God, get him back. So it's social dynamics. I, I kind of didn't hit it the right way before, but I don't care if you sell insurance. I don't care what you do. Be the person that's overly thoughtful. Be the person that remembers all the info about all oh, what their kids' names are, what's going on in your life. Make it about others where the benefits are all about them. The less you make it about how great you are, the more how great you're going to make other people feel or how good you're going to do for them, the better you'll do in any business. Yeah, for sure, man. Love that. This has been amazing, man. I know I know you've got to go in a little while. It flew uh, we've by. I don't know what's going on. We've got a little bit of time yeah. left. But I did want to um, see, 
you know, we we talked about some examples, and sure. so tell me what you think we can go through. But there are a few kind of non-verbal communication things that are very common in just general life, and right. I feel like you're an expert in this. So, it, are there ones before I even go through a, a list? Are there ones that are like very common that people can learn? You know, you mentioned earlier about creating rapport and those sorts of things, but just even like spotting someone lying for example and sure. I, that seems a little bit more um edgy but you know are there are there other things that really come to mind if i said if someone listening to this could learn something by listening to this and practicing or something like that so there's there's a lot of tactics that i can give you that are kind of cookie cutter there's nlp there's yeah. cues and things that you'll say oh that i kind of see that but th the problem is is they don't fit everyone it's kind of like if you read a horoscope yeah, yeah. you'll read 10 horoscopes what are you uh, Gemini. So you'll read them, and I bet you out of those 10, seven of them will really resonate. And you'll be like, oh my God, it's right now that's happening. It says, I'm going to meet yeah. new people and I need to really engage. Or you know, it's, I'm yeah. going through a transition. Yeah, in my life. exactly. Yeah. Oh my God, I quit my job. Yeah. But three out of 10 are going to be absurd. You're going to find little points that work. Yeah. So here's my thing I think that so much of it is knowing and reading social cues. When you walk up to people, what are they thinking in that moment? Do they want to be a part of this? Do they not? How do you transition it? People generally love talking about the most important elements of their life, themselves, yeah. their family, their friends, and their aspirations. The more you can get them talking about that, the more information you can glean to use to win them over. Whether win them over is business-related, relationship-related, how to you know, foster a better friendship. But I know people that like, that, like I have a buddy who's in insurance, who's so good at his job because everyone he does business with, he's like buddies with. Yeah, he yeah. creates a, a rapport where they don't want to source another quote because he's their guy. Do yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? You know when you have that person like, oh, yes. I got to call it. Yeah. You, if you can be that person in whatever you do, that's critical. And I think that there's people that are unnatural at it that are just effervescent, extroverted, they're good at it. But you got to study what they're doing differently. Now, in terms of catching people lie, I do that in my show all the time. But it's done, again, in a very – it's kind of like – if we were playing poker right now with eight people, I can't know everybody who's lying because it's happening too fast and I'm not controlling the flow. It's like back to that thing where it's a director. I'm pointing the camera at what I want you to see. So, so many of my skills don't work in real life if I'm not the one controlling the way the situation is. I'm not like omnipotent. I wish it was mentalism and I could just do it everywhere. But I need certain situations to arise where I control them for me to then know how you're thinking. I think you can tell a tremendous amount based on body language where the obvious one, if people are leaning in mm, and engaged. people are leaning out, if you create, uh, this was in the game, but this is something I've been doing forever, create a time limit. When you walk up and start a conversation, you do something, having some sort of a limit where you go, oh, this is amazing. I'm gonna have to go in just a couple minutes, but, and so if you create that moment of, oh, they have to go, you feel more as if these next minutes are going to count more, even if you were going to leave scarcity, anyway in two right? minutes. Yeah. What's that? The scarcity. Like scarcity. Yeah. That one called cat string theory, which is exactly what you said. A cat only wants the string when it's being moved around. When you drop it, it's not interesting. So if you make yourself too accessible, that hurts you. And that hurt me for years, where if I'm the person picking up the phone when you call my website, instantly knock a zero off what I can charge you because I'm too easy to access, right? You can't call Drake on the phone and say, come over to my place and do a party tomorrow, Drake. You're going to work through so many people to get to Drake. Drake, right at this moment, I assure you, is doing exactly what we're doing. Breathing, eating, crapping. He's a person. He has the same amount of hours in the day and a whole lot of projects. So it's all the scarcity associated with it, what that time is valued as and how you view it. Everything is about how you view it. So create that dynamic of seeming more scarce or seeming more in demand. So much of it is just, I just watched the thing about Elizabeth Holmes, the Th Theranos. Oh my God, crazy. It, just amazing what she did with, with virtually nothing to show how many $900 million, $700 million of investor money because of her story, just capturing someone's imagination. So how do you create a narrative that captures imagination? It's hard for me to give you like direct tips. I can give you tips on memory, body language cues, but they're not, the ones I'll give you What's going to happen is if I use them, I can see you and apply them in a way where I'll know that my hit rate is maybe 90% because I know the person, I know their dynamic yeah. and I can, I can, if I give it to you, it's going to give you like a 5% alpha. It yeah, might work 55% yeah. of the time instead of just a coin flip. Okay. And you'll do it three times. You'll get it right once and you'll be like, ah, that guy's full of crap. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the typical part. No, that's fair. That's fair. No, I respect that. It's kind of like, I thought I'd ask just in, in case there were some common 
uh, easy to digest things, but I think this is so nuanced, right? And it's this it's so many details, and I respect this area. So this is a whole field of study, and it's a field of study of psychology, science, biology. Like there's so many things coming together, so I don't expect to like be able to do it straight away. But just uh, that 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 was already helpful to to understand how it all kind of comes together. Yeah, I mean, people can lie to your face, and if they're really good at it, you'll be, you'll believe them. And I think that most people have a BS detector and they have that intuition, they actually have an internal monologue that talks them out of it. So they'll be like, I think they'll lie to themselves. I've seen so many situations where you go, that went great. And I go, I don't think it did go great. Yeah, I the think gut. That you're like, not, I guess people just call it the gut or not. The gut. That different? Yeah. The gut that reads you. So there is something like a dog can sense fear in a, in a person in a way that's that seems supernatural. They can tell fear and, and tension before you even do. They know if you're scared of it. Yeah, yeah, I know the feeling. And so what are they, you know? And, and <laughs> yeah. Versus someone who loves a dog and comes up, and if you, as soon as you approach the dog lovingly, that dog is fine with you. If you approach it with fear, you'll get what you give. So in my profession, it's such a weird thing, but if I don't go into something confident, like I have TV appearances where I can point out to you where if I didn't know going into it, and you say to me, what if that could have gone wrong? I go, it 100% could have gone wrong. If I didn't go into it fully thinking this is going to work, then my own level of dominance in what I'm performing and doing to you and, and in essence crafting how you're going to behave and react wouldn't have worked. If I went in with any fear, the same way that a dog smells fear, the person would have felt something was off and they would not have let me do what I needed to do. It yeah. sounds really weird and creepy, but I mean like when you're trying to manipulate people's thoughts and patterns and how they're going to behave in a certain situation and choose things that seem random, if you don't do it compellingly enough and with enough conviction – it goes against you. Yeah. It's like someone that tries to hypnotize you. If you don't trust them, you can't be hypnotized mm. by them. They have to build that rapport. They have to believe a little bit as well. Not believe, but also have trust and faith in you. Okay. You can't hypnotize somebody against their will. Yeah, yeah. It can't be done. Um, have you seen, you know, you obviously know who Darren Brown is, Of course. Right? So he's the British uh, mentalist. He is amazing. the world he's, mentalist. He's, he's the one be of the yeah. best, if not the best, in oh, the modern amazing. years. And um, I watched that show on Netflix. He's had a bunch, but like... Um, the one about the kind of evangelical church, like replicating what happens in, in if I'm saying this right, yeah, I think you so. know, where people will be like work, walking on the stage and then they'll be like, do this little thing and then they'll be like, oh, I'm falling on the floor and yeah. like all this crazy stuff. And he kind of replicates that. Like that, when I see stuff like that, like it just makes me think like, what is going on in the world, man? <laughs> because like, and again, this is probably a whole two hour conversation on its right. own, but just that whole world, of like people being able to manipulate people. Well, um, I mean, organized religion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what you believe. If you're silly to think that your your thoughts or that you're, you, that, that's changed over time. Any religion that exists has evolved over and over and over for modern day whatever, right? It doesn't matter. None of them are the same as they were hundreds and hundreds of years ago. They evolve and it's it's a behavioral structure. Whether you think that's divine, whether you think it's from person, either way, it's, it's a structure of behavior that they want you to adopt and it's a great way to know how to give stories and I think people love stories or everything. Like yeah. my whole show revolves kind of around telling a story. Uh, every form of entertainment does but yeah, how do you control people's behavior? That, that's what I'm studying. A, a lot of stuff that's in religious texts and in yeah. kind of the way I've seen preachers, pastors, speakers, anyone that can weave a very strong narrative that mm. captures you, I've studied because yeah. that, that's what I'm emulating. Really? Okay. Do you ever feel like there's an element of like you're persuading people, but you use the word manipulate, right? And yeah. to some people, manipulate sounds like a negative word. Sure. So like, where's the fine line between where you feel like, am I like taking someone down a wrong path or, because obviously your intention is this entertainment. Right. So is that where it differentiates, where it's just about the intent? Yes. I think it's purely intent driven because if I was trying to, let's say that, Instead of me asking you, hey, I want you to think right now of a person, and then I reveal to you I knew who that person would be in a way that's just impossible. What if we said that, think of somebody close to your heart that's died and that you would really love to be in touch with, and now I know that person's name, because I, I obviously would if I was about to do this, and what if I could glean personal information to convince you that I must be in touch with them or have something beyond this world, and now I say, hey, pay me X, Y, and Z, and we'll continue the session. Now, yeah. if I'm not doing that genuinely, what I think intentions everything in that case when I'm doing my show it's structured as look what I'm doing it's a skill that's attainable that's the key difference most psychics don't tell you that you can read a book and become psychic 
They have a special power. So mine is a scientific, it's a skill. It really is. It's, it's engineering. It's reverse engineering the human brain. The fact that I know how you'll think so I can hopefully amaze you by fooling you. And it's not always fooling. Some people, they kind of know how I did it. They just can't believe that that's how I pulled it off. But I'm doing it in the sense of I'm never setting myself apart from other people. And I am never going to lie to you about what I can or can't do. Mm. Have you ever been, you said you've performed in 40 different countries, right? Yeah. And um, like I can just talk from my own personal experience before I offend anyone. But uh, my f I grew up in the UK. Yeah. Uh, my family's Pakistani, right? So, and uh, Muslim background. But there's within our culture, there's a, there's a term called a jinn. Have you heard this term before? Yeah. It's essentially like a spirit. But f to some people, they will believe in a jinn, which is essentially like a spirit or another um, living being that isn't a human. In the same way, in, in all cultures, they have the equivalent of this. It's essentially a spirit or something like that. Sure. So, like, have you ever been in a situation where someone just literally doesn't believe that you've just worked this stuff out? Of course. And they're like, no, you're, you're like supernatural. Or yeah. Does that happen quite a lot? It, 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 <laughs> so I bet it happens more than I think, yeah. but people are embarrassed to say it. Yeah, yeah. So it takes a different level of person to come up and really say that, especially I've had people that are very prominent say things like that, where they think like, hey, is this, is this a trick or this is real, right? But you have to pretend like it's a trick so that you don't give up. They think that it's like a superhero and I'm a real psychic and I'm using this because I don't want to show that I'm really actually psychic, you know, as if you had the powers. If you were Superman, but you were wearing the cape, and then you're Clark Kent just to be on the low key. Like I'm keeping down low. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you're not telling us. Uh, yeah, and people that have down. called and said, hey, I really want to do a reading. Can you help me? I know you can. I go, I, I don't do that. I don't do anything supernatural or that sort because I wouldn't feel okay with it. But that is a testament to the show when people get to that level. And also it's a testament to how deeply some of these people really want there to be another life or to be more to this world than what they see. And I feel like, yeah, that's a great, that's a great point because I feel like everyone wants to understand the unknown and there's so many things even if you're a straight rationalist or a atheist or a on the other side a really spiritual religious person who uh, believes in all these different things like there's still a bunch of things we don't know sure. right and, and that's kind of where i net out on that continuum is like there's a bunch of stuff i know i th know that i don't know and i'm open to understanding but but then there's uh, some stuff i feel like i do know whether that is like science-based or reality-based um but you could kind of be going around in circles all day thinking if that stuff is real or not just that, even asking yeah. that question is a joy right because yeah you don't really get it a lot of the time or and wh which question to say just just the nature of things so i have a lot of time in my show where people question things that they've seen because they it just doesn't seem possible and that's a fun thing you don't get it you know it's it just it's a you don't get that feeling a lot. And it's a shame for me because I don't get that feeling a lot because I know how most of my craft works. Yeah. But there's a real joy in being fooled. Like even as, as, as what I do as a mentalist or magician, for me to see a trick or a routine that fools me, it's a great feeling. Oh, it's the it's, best. It's very fulfilling and satisfying. So like humor and this yeah. is like the two, for me, they're just on another level because there's just like the the art that went into it, the thinking that went into it is just, and execution is just, it's, it's insane. Um, I, I do want to give you some time to go in a, in a little bit. I don't know if you're open to doing one last sort yeah, of thing, absolutely. if possible, just to close it out, because we've had such an amazing conversation. We started with a great uh, demonstration. And if we could, if there is something that comes to mind, that would be great. Yeah, and then there are a couple of questions just to finish off, but that would be awesome. I want you to think of someone, because that, that's, that's really the whole point of this podcast, right? All these people that you hear this, and I hope get a takeaway and enjoy this. And then they talk about it. They tell other people the word keeps spreading, right? Creator lab. That's the goal. And that they get some sort of piece of information today that was useful. Think of someone that you will talk to in the next few weeks. It could be a friend. It could be family. It could be somebody that you don't even know why you'll speak to them. Or maybe you'll just send them a Facebook message. Or maybe you will send a text. Or start thinking of your social and work circles. And picture people's faces. Oh, man. You going to do this? <laughs> this is my wallet. Oh, my God. Don't let them see my, my, Dude, my Chase is, card. Okay. I'm going to leave it right here. All right. Tell so me, someone I'm going to speak to in the next few weeks. Speak to, email, text, Does it matter DM, if they're close or not doesn't close? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. 
Oh man, this you're gonna do this right do this. now. <laughs> commit, commit, because if I tell you to think okay. of it, and then everyone at home and I reveal, and you'll just say he played along. No, no, this. I want you to jot down this person's name. Uh, maybe you'll show the camera. Take it, just the first name. Do it under the table, and I'm just gonna turn and face this camera. Yeah, Hold so, on, you. Oh, so you want me pen. to? Oh yeah. Either one, I don't yeah. care. Just I want to be big enough, and I'm gonna close my eyes. Okay, I'm just gonna wait. One Make sure I can't see, and then everyone can see that my eyes are closed. Yeah, your eyes are closed. So yeah, your eyes are definitely closed. And you I'm showing. It? Uh, yeah, but I'm showing. I showed the camera. Is that right? You did. Yeah, yeah. Could I have seen? No, let me just make. Okay, I'll turn all right, you turn right. Yeah, you turn the other way. And uh, all right, I hope the camera can see that. Okay. Okay. Couldn't have seen, right? Yeah, yeah. No I've uh, okay folded. Can I'll I fold a few times? Yeah, or? fold again. Yeah, Doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. You know what? Let me grab the pen. Here's okay. my thoughts. Normally, I would have had you show at the end, but if you already showed, then take this thing. Is it folded? Yeah, I'm gonna like, fold a couple uh, more times. Well, don't fold too small. Okay. Destroy it. Take this sucker. Oh, okay. Look, look, look. Rip and okay. rip and You're hold your away. hand out. Look away. Take, take, rip. Look. You're looking away. Look, look in the camera. <laughs> I want to make sure. Is there anything sure in my finger? Make sure with the mic if we could. Sorry. Yes, make sure. <laughs> I can't see anything. Yeah, you definitely can't. I know you would have picked a guy. I know it. Before we even started, it was a uh, guarantee. If it was a woman, there would have been much more excitement in your eyes. I would have seen like more. And you're still sweating though. Oh, dude. Are you going to see him face to face? Like I discussed, or are you probably going to call? Well, like, what do you think is going to be the communication? Well, after he sees this. Yeah, <laughs> I hope. Um, do you want me to say it out loud? Um, most likely, we'll probably uh, call or text. Did you mention this person at any point in the podcast or to me in the setting up of this interview or anything whatsoever? No. And can I show this in the camera? I think they saw this inside of here. And there's no way that you know of this. Like it's a well, look, look, inside, yeah. I'm putting this down, there's a zipper. Okay. Oh and my I have God. one card, and it's a, oh, something I want you to keep from this experience. Oh Open that little zipper. Can I put this down? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Open the zipper. Yeah, yeah. Dude, not. And it's my business card. Always business first, <laughs> business growth. And read the note on the back when you talk to him. Oh my God! No way, dude. <laughs> Can you see that? Oh my God! This is so ridiculous. Wait, if you can zoom in. Editor, can we zoom in, please? <laughs> That's insane. Move it closer, even? Yeah, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this out um, for the podcast people. It says, be sure to tell Hamza about me. It's a very common name, too, oh, Hamza. This was a very, I, I played the odds. Okay. Dude, this is stupid because there's literally, I mean, oh, God, the, the, the overthinking mind is thinking like, you know, your mind is going to melt because you go, what if I would have done different person? I, and I thought of someone else yeah, first yeah, and then yeah. I changed but the public, you know, because I'm, I did think at the time, like I could pick someone where there's literally no public record or any record on social media that you might have been able to see or something like that. And even if you did look at that, I've interacted with lots of people. So, oh man. That's the, the, the best way to end this thing. Huh? That is insane. With dude. a moment of wonder <laughs> and <laughs> everybody watching is just going to say over and over and you will tell them, up and down. Hey, this is not set up. And until you Hamza, experience it, when you're in a show with 50, 100, 200 other mad. people and you do it for everyone in the crowd and they just, that that's the best. That's mad. That's mad. Well, listen, Hamza, if you're listening, which you probably are, you got to share this with your parents. And one of them is definitely saying you're a gin. So. <laughs> <laughs> I am a gin. Yeah. Um, listen, man, that's amazing. I, g g do you mind if I ask you one, two, sure, three, yeah. just to finish off? Because it's just a nice way to get totally. to know you. I always, it's difficult in podcasts because I feel I ramble way too no, much. No, no, you've endlessly. done a great job. This is incredible. This has been one of the best interviews I've ever done. I'm so happy we've done this. Um, just look, like we've talked, I'm still like, maybe we shouldn't write the end because I'm like in <laughs> awe. I'm recording another episode after this too. I'm going to have to calm down for a bit. Person's going to be shaken <laughs> up. Yeah. Dude, that was incredible. They're like going to feel their water cup shaking from my mad. gin energy when I yeah, leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can feel it. Listen, so we've got, and the other thing is, sorry, I will say, I use your pen, right? Use your pen. Uh, but the problem you, is but your pen doesn't yeah, show yeah, up yeah. on It doesn't camera. show. No, and the I, only reason. And you did say like, use your pen if you want, but... But, not uh, a pen. I assure you. I just knew that you wouldn't be able to see it on camera. No, no, that pen. makes sense. No, no, no. I, I don't think it's like a magic pen. It's just, man, I don't know. <laughs> oh, God. All right. Last things. Um, damn. We talked about success already. And I think you've kind of shared a little bit about what you think of success yourself. But ultimately, that's all. You know, we all want to be successful in our own ways, whatever that means. But instead of saying, like, what does it mean to you? Like, I'd love to. If there are people that you think of as successful, if I say the word success, who are the people you think of? Like, I'd love to just 
think about some of those people and and just share like what makes them successful to you? Whether it's one person, two, three people. It's so hard because a lot of the people you see in the public eye, I yeah. don't know how successful they are, right? It's yeah, their image that's successful. That's true. More and more what I've learned just from being a parent is just that success is not always, I was very driven in earlier years where it's like monetary, success, career, and you start realizing more and more that time is very limited. It it's yeah. almost feels, uh, I read this one article, I don't remember where it was, it was this really into its string theory about like the fact that your whole life is a scroll that all exists and it's just being unrolled and there is no present moment because every present moment is already gone, right? We're already missing it and just years start going by very fast. I feel especially at certain thresholds, people have said it to me, I've asked my parents like, what decade went by the fastest? And they have said to me every single time, every last decade feels the fastest, mm -hmm. right? Like my 20s felt somewhat fast, now I'm in my mid 30s. I feel like this one's going even faster. Every single one as you get to that finish line seems to keep advancing. So I'm realizing more and more that you need to value your time in a certain way. And, and people that do that effectively, successfully, it, you can only juggle so much. And I, have, I travel a lot for work. I'm the one who's very, and I'm, I'm very driven because I wanna create a legacy where my kids won't have to work as hard if they don't need to. We have everything we need, just things that are the trappings of success, but that make life easier, if you will. But being with them and seeing them, I think is a vast measure of success. I get more joy right now out of being with one of my kids and having a fun afternoon than anything I do career-wise. There's yeah. no level of like joy, it's pure no joy. Comparison, yeah. It's just, it's a different version. I couldn't have one without the other. If I was just sitting at home and I was kind of a bum, the rest would fall apart a little bit because I would probably be itching for something else. It's balance. Yeah. Uh, I think, I'm trying to think who, it's so hard to know because I could tell you celebrities, but I don't necessarily know those people. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah. You just know the image you see on I get TV you. of them. I get you. Yeah, fair enough. All right, well, I like that, though, because there's an element of the balance. Obviously, still some... Find your balance, because for yeah. a lot of people, they might not be as career-driven, and you hear yeah. this, and you feel like, if I'm not killing it, if I'm not making X, Y, and Z, that's a terrible way to monitor your, your happiness. That's something I've had to learn over time, is the more you compare yourself to other people, you will never be happy. Sure. There's probably a billionaire who's got a 400-foot yacht, and he's pissed he doesn't have the 450-foot yacht, right? Somebody will always be better, bigger, richer, any of those things, you need to figure out how you can find fulfillment for yourself. And I've been, I've been guilty of it more with success than without. Mm. I feel like when I was less successful, every, I remember You're certain moments grateful. where I had a show that was blown away. I got a big check and at the time it felt like so much money, you know, and, and, and you value it. You value what you don't have. Once you have it, you lose it. Uh, I actually run like marathons and ultra marathons. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of those things where you can't fake it. I don't care who you are next to me. I don't care what you do in life. For some of these races, I've run like 100 miles, 153 miles. You can't fake that. You have to do it. And the achievement is the doing it, right? Like I like the suffering. I like going into it not knowing what's going to happen mm. because a lot of life, I know what's going to happen. Yeah. That's a great way that I try to think about the process, not just the outcome. So like even with like on a small scale like this podcast, yeah. like I can't think about like if I thought, how many people are gonna watch this? How many people, I've spent all this time and money and energy. It's like, no, no, I have to enjoy this moment. Yeah. And if this is enough for me, then everything else is a bonus. And that's where I've landed now, where I'm just, in the beginning, I'm just like, oh, I have to take over the world and you know, do all that yeah. stuff. But the truth is, once you actually focus on this, everything else follows anyway. So that's a great, uh, that's if a great lesson, If you do great man. work, yeah. it, 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 it does its own thing. And also this is like, think about how many doors this opens for you that you can't see where the threads will go yeah. in like a few years or you it's it's just a i think it's a brilliant idea yeah it's a good name too yeah it appreciate sounds it, man. like very polished yeah creator lab it's you know it's just a very it doesn't seem necessarily tech startup-y it exactly. gives you a, lo a lot of avenues to go down thanks man i specifically stayed away from stuff that was just tech startup -y, even though i have a bunch of people from that world because i i'm interested in so many things and i don't want to limit myself and i also think like tech startups in the last 10 years have created a bunch of value, but like in 20 years, it might be different. And right. and also we can all learn from each other. Like someone listening to this is gonna take plenty away from what you've shared today. And that so. is, yeah, and that's the point. And, and you should be able to learn from all sorts of people. That's kind of the basis of the show. Um, the last question, just to close out, man, like if you, if I said your legacy is such a, like a big word, but if you were looking back and you're 87 years old, 
and you're looking back and you said, okay, these are my last days maybe, and hopefully not, but you know, let's say oh, they yeah. are. <laughs> um, this was my legacy. This is what I did in, in the time I was here. Like what would that stand out? What would stand out to you at that moment? I think experiences are the biggest ones. Yeah. I really do like, uh, like things with family. Everyone will say the same thing. Some of my races stand out because just the amount of work and effort that went into them, I think almost none of them will be monetary or career. I think that that's stuff that just feeds into other things, right? That just makes the rest of life better. Uh, but I love achieving things. I enjoy the moment of like when I do a show, there's no better rush. There's no more. The feeling is great. But I just know I, I'm doing this thing where I keep like I'll turn down uh, I'll, I'll turn down things that are in life to do work. And I'm trying to shift that balance away now where I will take life instead of work because I realize it's a fleeting moment. I don't think anybody ever sits down when they're 87 and go, oh, I should have worked those two extra weeks instead of taking this amazing vacation that, or if you meet someone and they're like some 20 year old kid, they don't know what they're doing and they're gonna go travel the world for a few months. I'm like, do it, do it. I don't care how much money you have, if you're gonna backpack. These are the things that you're gonna remember and that are gonna create who you are as a person. There's almost never like people that I've seen that did sabbaticals, that took leaps of faith and for me, look at me. I, if you just went back in my life to 2005 and you look at a parallel universe. If you stayed. I would, exactly. Oh I'd be God. 14 years later in an office doing this. Now, that's not a bad life. I'm not knocking it. But I don't think I'd be the same person or as fulfilled or anything. Like all these opportunities, these people I've met, these things I've gotten to do, places I've traveled to are all because at one moment I just said, you know what? What's the worst that can happen if I yeah, quit? Yeah. Let's do it. What's Love the that. worst that can happen? Yeah, that's the way That's the way to finish, man. I appreciate you so much, Thank man. Thank you. And we got a lot more to do together for sure, man. Let's this do has it. Been, um, and for people, you know, we met two years ago. Yeah. And we uh, kept talk, in touch because it could have fallen touch, apart. And, and I, I always like so to, I, I told you, follow up, follow up, follow up. For sure, man. We're here. So thanks, man. That was incredible. I've never done anything like that. So uh, I'm excited to get this out to people and share it out. Um, again, thanks to the listing party in Canal Street Market for hosting us today. Where can people follow you uh, on online and stuff? Uh, so you can follow me. Instagram is the best one. I've got Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Yeah. They're all the same. So my name, it's so weird. It's, it looks like Oz. Yeah. It should be Oz. O-Z. But it's O-Z. an Israeli yeah. name. Yeah. And so like when Dr. Oz came here from Turkey, he switched it. I've <laughs> talked right. to him about this. Yeah. Uh, mine was still the original pronunciation. So it's O's. O's. Sounds like, like somebody owes you money. <laughs> <laughs> so it's O's the Mentalist. So just go to at O Z the Mentalist. We'll share it I'll on, be the only one. on YouTube right now. The at, and we'll share that out. Or all and the Aussies who go Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. They all think <laughs> I'm Oz, like like the land of Oz. It's amazing. Well, man, you you clearly have more than a talent. And uh, I love that there's so much in this conversation. But like from all the um, the mental stuff, the psychology stuff, but also just your career, how you turn a, a hobby into something that is a lot more than that, a full-time career. You live a great life, man, and you've, you've built it and you earned it. So uh, congrats to everything you've done, man. Thanks. Uh, this is great. All right, everyone, um, share this out with your friends and uh, check if you're not on YouTube already. It's youtube.com forward slash creator lab FM and um, lots more coming for you. Cheers, Hit man. Hit that subscribe button. Yeah, smash the subscribe. <laughs> Cheers, dude. Later. Right, bye-bye.